Another year, another Daytona 500 has come and gone, but this one has a bit more importance than the last couple. This is the start of an era in every single way imaginable for NASCAR. And really, the big thing that we need to go right into with it is the racing itself and the package, the car, the next gen race car. You see, the next gen race car has been something that's been a pet project of NASCAR's to be brought to competition for years now. And to see it come to fruition is a great accomplishment, but that accomplishment only goes as far as how good the race itself was. I think a lot of us going into this race were wondering if we were going to see a repeat of 2013, a race that was just absolutely atrocious, everyone was single file, and everyone remembers it for all the wrong reasons. And, and when you look back at the last two times a new car was introduced in NASCAR, both 2013 and 2008, if you look at the race overall as a whole race, both leave plenty to be desired, even though they have their good moments and finishes. But this race for me was really, really good. And this was because of the package, in my opinion. You see, this package to me reminded me of many things. And in a way, it was many things put together. But in and of itself, it has its own identity. You see, just like the previous package, any line on the racetrack could be used. Bottom, middle, top, very top, wherever it might be. They could use it. They could draft on it. No line had the absolute definitive advantage over the other during this race. Yes, the top line had a lot of control, but so too did the bottom at different times. Depended on who was in the line and how they were drafting. So in that way, it's like the previous package. But there were tandems that were seen like the COT days. That right there was really seen a lot on the restarts and down the backstretch. These cars bumpers don't match up the way that the COTs did, so they really can't do this kind of drafting all the way around the track like they probably would want to. But there was a lot of losing the draft, and that was like the Gen 4 era. Losing the draft was something that was actually a lot more common back then, and to see it semi-common in this race was something that was very refreshing when it came to really seeing how drivers had to strategize and push forward to how they were going to race in whatever circumstances it might be. Now, there were really good and big runs in this race. Guys could get in the draft and just absolutely fire up towards somebody else, but they weren't the way they were in the last package where closing rates were insanely high. The closing rates for this package were fast, don't get me wrong. They were a lot faster than a lot of others, and there wasn't a bubble of air keeping the cars apart. But they were just slow enough, in a sense, that it meant that drivers could have some reaction time. Blocks could be thrown without there being accidents, and moves could be made without them hitting another car, similar to last year's Daytona 500 finish. And overall, it made a great first showing. You see, this is something that I think has already put the next gen above the gen six at this stage. Having a great start, in my opinion, goes a long way for fans, both present as well as those that may come in the future. Personally, this race reminded me of a plate race from 2003 to about 2007, the late gen four plate era where the closing rates weren't insanely high, but were still good enough, we had plenty of great moves, and we had plenty of battles for the lead. This altogether made the on-track action, in a vacuum, amazing to see. But something else that was amazing to see was the crowd itself. I want to talk about this really quick because we see a lot of news and a lot of negativity about NASCAR's attendance and TV ratings, but when you look at the way that the crowd was, it was absolutely insane. There were estimates that between 140 and 160,000 people at this race, one of the biggest Daytona 500 crowds since about 2011. There was tons of energy. Going to the grandstands, for instance, they were playing Sweet Caroline and the entire undercarriage of the grandstand was screaming the song along. 
There were plenty of people all over the trioval grass for the Luke Combs concert. And there was plenty of energy all around of fans just having a great time. It was something that wasn't present in the last two Daytona 500s that I had been at. Again, it felt like an atmosphere a 2000s race to be at in person. And that was a great feeling because those races always had an electric buzz in the air, just like this race does. Now, there's five drivers I really want to talk about when it comes to this race. We've talked about the setting, we've talked about the package, but we got to talk about the men behind the wheel. Number one, of course, is number one, Austin Sindrick. The man has his first win, which is, in my opinion, almost always a positive for the sport, and he is automatically in the playoffs. That right there is huge. Then you have Bubba Wallace. He finished P2, barely missing out on beating the two car. The only thing I think that was really holding him back on that last restart was the fact that part of his fender was completely gone. It had just been launched into space. Then, of course, you have Harrison Burton. He looked really good out there. I had my questions and doubts about Harrison Burton. He had struggled a lot in the Xfinity series, and in my opinion, I didn't think he was ready for a cup ride. And in a lot of ways, I still don't think that. But when it comes to this race, he didn't just hold his own. He raced up front. He was one of the guys who would have decided who won this race until, of course, he got flipped in the big one. Then you have Kyle Busch who was in the first wreck and avoided all the others in what looked like a lot of ways the bullet dodging scene in the Matrix. It was amazing to see. And then, of course, you have Brad Keselowski, who, with RFK, the team he currently co-owns, was an absolute menace out there. When you have Ricky Stenhouse Jr. going out of his way to rip you one, then I really think you need to watch how you were driving. For someone who had complained for years upon years about young drivers blocking and racing hard at these tracks, Brad Keselowski looked like a massive hypocrite this weekend. But I will say, he made it really interesting. He was someone who was willing to make moves, and it was really fun to see from the stands. But as for the probably dozen drivers he crashed, yeah, I don't think it'd be as fun for them. Now, there is something that was not good about this race, and that was the issues with the wheels. You see, if you haven't heard, NASCAR has switched from five lug nuts to a single lug wheel. And of course, there's going to be growing pains with such a massive change. But here's the biggest problem. Two wheels flew off in this race, and that isn't good, and I do think it's a growing pain, and I will say I don't think it's the end of the world right now, as I do think this is something that should be remedied, but this is something that should be cause for concern. Wheels don't just fly off all the time and have safe and happy endings. Those wheels could bounce into the infield. We've seen that before. They could bounce into another car and maybe into the air and possibly at some point into the grandstands. And cars without wheels tend not to drive too well, especially in packs at Daytona or Talladega, but just in general, they tend to crash. And that's something that I think NASCAR needs to work immediately on trying to get down. You see, a lot of people had a lot of talks about Harrison Burton's flip and how we need to stop cars from going airborne. While I agree with that, I think the more large and logical scale thing to look at is this wheel issue. You see, Daytona doesn't have the biggest G-Force load on the wheels. It's only going to get tougher from here, especially at tracks like Dover and Bristol. So I think that this is something that needs to be watched by fans and that fans need to hold NASCAR's feet to the fire on. But overall, I don't think that it takes away from how good this race was. Personally, I hope that this race absolutely killed it in the ratings. I hope that there were double digit million people watching this race, enjoying it, and seeing that this is the start of the new era of NASCAR. Because if that's the case, and if this is any indication, which let's be real, it's a super speedway, it probably isn't, but if it is, it's gonna probably be a pretty fun era to look at. Now, with all that being said, those are my quick thoughts before I get on the road to head home from Daytona 
I want to hear what you have to say from your homes. So let me know down in the comments below. What did you think of the 2022 Daytona 500? And what did you think of the next gen car? And while you're at it, leave a like on this video, share this video, and subscribe to my channel for more great NASCAR content like this throughout the future. And to all my channel members, thank you so much for your support. So until next time, have a good one.